Imagine having to spend more than two decades in court fighting the Canadian government to reclaim your legal identity. That is what author, artist, and advocate Lynn Gale did, because certain provisions in the Indian Act denied her Indigenous status. Her new book chronicles the arduous journey as defended in that landmark case. It's called Gale vs. Canada, challenging sex discrimination in the Indian Act, and it brings Lynn Gale to our airwaves tonight from Peterborough, Ontario. Lynn, it's great to meet you. How are you doing tonight? Good. Thank you for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Not at all. I just want to start with the title of your book, which is very stark, Gale vs. Canada. Did it feel sometimes during this journey like you were taking on the whole country? Yes, initially the court case was called um, Gale versus the Queen. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Certainly, you know, the Department of Justice has deep pockets. They have a half a billion dollar budget and a staff of, of 5,000. And then there's just me. So, yes, I did. Hmm. For years, you tried to get status as a member of the Algonquin of Pickwakanagan First Nation. How come or how did you come not to have that status in the first place? So I inherited uh, sex discrimination. It was an intergenerational uh, inheritance. My great grandmother was removed from uh, Pickwakanagan in the 30s with her children, my, my grandmother being one of them, because of issues um, around sex discrimination. Because her lineage, her lineage came through. Um, well, her husband, his lineage came through. Oh, terrible, through his mother line. So his name was Joseph Gagne, and my great-grandmother was Annie Jane Maness. They were both Indigenous from Pickwaknagan, and they were moved because of issues of sex discrimination in the Indian Act. Well, in fact, you shared a letter that your great-grandmother received in January of 1945, and we're going to put a photo up of it right now, and it reads, Dear Madam, I am in receipt of a copy of your letter recently sent to the Indian Affairs Branch, Ottawa, with regard to your status as an Indian. In reply... I wish to inform you that you are not an Indian as defined by the Indian Act. At the time of your marriage to Joseph Gagnon, a white man, any rights you had as an Indian of the Golden Lake Band ceased and you became a white woman. And then, pathetically, it signed yours very truly, H.P. Ruddy, Indian agent. Just talk about the impact that a letter like that would have had on your great-grandmother. I never had the opportunity to meet my great grandmother. I know that I, when I received it in the mail from an archivist, it, it floored me, like r really floored me. I'm, I'm happy that you read it and you didn't ask me to read it because it's, it's a pretty emotional letter. But what's interesting, or I guess not interesting, what it, what it uh, demonstrates is that men don't lose their status if they quote unquote marry out, but women do. Have I got that right? Well, that was prior, uh, you know, prior to 1985, that was the case. And now um, you, you don't like you don't lose status or gain status uh, through marriage. They changed that in 1985. And then they also, of course, incorporated new forms of sex discrimination in the Indian Act in 1985. Uh, talk about that. What does that mean? Sure. So in terms of Gale versus Canada, I'll just limit my discussion to there. So prior to 1985, they had a, a I'm going to call it a wonderful provision that protected children of unknown and unstated paternity. Um, when the father, when the man or the father wasn't known, the child was uh, a status Indian like the mother. But 1985, what they did is they secretly took that out and became uh, the, uh, the Indian Act became silent on that very matter. And then at the level of policy and practice within the Department of Indian Affairs, they were harming those children. They were they were ruling or making decisions that, in, in essence, um, meant the man was a white man, and then these children were being denied um, their Indian status registration. So that's that's what happened in 1985. There's other forms of sex discrimination that were created as well. But um, you know what's really disturbing about that situation is it's often said that the Indian Act was amended in 1985 to bring it in line with the Charter, and it just completely failed to do that and actually what happened was the legislative change opportunity became um, an opportunity to create new forms of sex discrimination which is horrific well the charter came in in 1982 so we're talking about just a few years after that uh, why do you think it was in in spite of the charter apparently being applied here why do you think it didn't work I think it was an intentional strategy on the part of um, Canada to obfuscate and disguise new forms of sex discrimination. 
And how old were you when you started this battle for your status? So I was only in my 20s, you know, around the time of 1982 and 1985, and now I'm pushing 60. So it's, <laughs> you know, a long time. <laughs> Indeed. No, this is clearly something that has been of crucial interest to you. Maybe you could tell us why it was so important to you that you've spent so much of your life on this. Sure. So I don't know if it was an interest, but certainly I was motivated. Um, I think it was the the amendment to the to the Indian Act in 1985. It made me realize that my grandmother and my father were potentially entitled to Indian status registration, and um, I needed to do something constructive with my life. I was, you know, in my 20s, and um, I I think I was really outraged when I realized that the the Indian Act was amended to to actually in a way that created new forms of sex discrimination, even though we had this charter. So I was horrified that that Canada was doing that, and I just um, took on the took on the activity. <laughs> Indeed, you did. Well, let me read an excerpt from the book, and then we'll come back and chat after I do this. You write, "I grew up not knowing who I was or what my place was within the Canadian mosaic. The contradiction was that I secretly knew I was an Algonquin. As a young person, I spent many years in critical contemplation of what was happening around me. You see, through processes of policy and legislation, my father, his mother, who is my kokomis, my great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother and I were denied who we were and are. Okay, let's unpack this. First of all, kokomis, what does that mean? Grandmother in the Anishinaabe Moen. Okay, very good. Did not having status preclude you from being able to return to your First Nation in any way? Yes, it, 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 it precluded my father and my grandmother and myself and my great grandmother. So it was generational. Um, yes, it did. Uh, because I was a non-status um, Algonquin person, I wasn't allowed to be a, a member of Pequawkinagon First Nation. And uh, of course, that was a barrier. Uh, um, Politically, it was a barrier. So now I am a uh, and status registered Indian with and Pickwalking Gun accepted me as a member. I'm so grateful that they accepted me as a band member. And now, because I am a band member, I'm allowed to um, permit. I'm permitted to sit more centrally in in the process of uh, the Algonquin land claim process in Ontario. So as a non-status person, I was more marginal. So for how many years were you? if you like, culturally prohibited from engaging with your First Nation? How many years? I was born into it. You were born into it. So it's essentially yes. all, all you knew until you eventually won. It was an exile. It was an exile that I inherited from my father, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother because of sex discrimination in the Indian Act. Hmm. Now, were you physically able to return to your First Nation territory? Well, I have a vision disability, right? Like a lot of indigenous people, my, uh, you know, uh, we we have a higher rate of disability, so I don't drive very well. And then there's, you know, I was born into poverty and violence and danger. And, uh, you know, my beginning of my life was more about survival. Uh, although um, in my early life, my father did take me to, to Golden Lake and um, he introduced me and made sure that I knew who my ancestors were, who my, who my cousins were. And who it was it was interesting. He was teaching me my kinship relations. Um, I think for ontological purposes, he really wanted me to know who I was as an Algonquin person, even though he wasn't allowed to be an Algonquin person. And while we were there, we would we would fish in the lake, but we we weren't allowed to. We were doing it illegally. And where is Golden Lake, incidentally? Highway 60 in between Algonquin Park and the city of Ottawa. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now, in your case, your status was denied because your father didn't know his paternity. Maybe you could give us some of the details around how that happened. Sure. So, you know, traditionally women had had babies and women had the jurisdiction of the Eastern doorway. Um, we, women didn't have to be married. That was a, that was a traditional way. So as I said, uh, prior to 1985, there were protective provisions for the children of unknown and unstated paternity where the child would be an Indian, just like their mother. But in 1985, they removed that and became silent on it. So in my journey of moving through the court system, I really didn't know what they were going to do about but the situation of my unknown grandfather. And what they ended up doing was they made a decision that had the effect
aspect of assuming he was a white man. So that meant that my father had a lesser form of status and he couldn't pass it on to me. Hmm. Now, I suspect a lot of people watching this have heard about the famous five, which admittedly goes back 100 years, but was a significant marker in the history of Canada in terms of women's rights. But we now have the indigenous famous six. Uh, and in fact, let's show a picture. There they are. Who are they? So that's uh, Senator Lillian Dick, Senator Sandra Lovelace, that's uh, Lynn Gale, <laughs> <laughs> Sharon MacGyver, Jeanette Laval, and Yvonne Bedard. And you have become the Indigenous Famous Six because why? Well, um, you know, along my way of learning how to read and write, uh, I had to, I realized I had to do something constructive to keep the idea in the collective consciousness. And so, you know, I studied critical theory and I understand counter hegemonic devices. So what I did is I created what's known as the Indigenous Famous Five. And I did that for, for strategic reasons. And I wasn't a member. And then as we were moving forward with Bill S3, um, um, FAFIA, the Feminist Alliance for International Action, um, they created the Indigenous Famous Six and they added me to it. So it was re it's really a political strategy, a counter-hegemonic strategy to give the ideology currency regarding the issue of sex discrimination. Hmm. Now, Famous Five works, of course, because it's got a nice alliteration. Once you got added and it became Six, did you think of changing the name to the Sensational Six or something like that? <laughs> I don't feel that sensational. I don't really feel that famous, but that's nice for the chuckle. Um, initially, they were just going to do the Famous Five and add me to it. They were going to use contemporary people who were still alive. Um, and then I said, well, you know, we can't really exclude Yvonne Bedard. You know, this process is all about disenfranchisement and we can't leave her out. So they actually expanded it to include her. And I'm happy about that. Good. Now, you mentioned in the last answer, Bill S-3, uh, S meaning it came out of the Senate. What was that bill supposed to do? Well, we were hoping, the Indigenous Famous Six, that it would eliminate all the sex discrimination and meet the 6-1-A all the way uh, concept that uh, we're Indigenous women and Indigenous men and their descendants born before 1985 were treated equally as 6-1-A. Um, unfortunately, it failed to do that, but it was later resolved through an order in council. And did the bill get passed to your satisfaction? The order in council was, was great. It was great. And it was interesting because I think Canada was pressured to address 6-1-A all the way because the Sharon MacGyver case was heard at the United Nations level, and the United Nations said, you have to meet 6-1-A all the way. And 6-1-A is what? 61A all the way is a, like a, a sub subsection of the Indian Act that essentially means treat all the women and all the men and their children the same, born before 1985. Gotcha. We're going to do another bit of uh, numerology here, and that is uh, when you, sort of circling back here to your uh, case in which you use the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, Section 15, is that the section of the Charter that you use to help your case? Yes, it is, uh, we were moving along. We, we were told we had to take um, a, a charter challenge, Section 15, to the Indian Act and, and Section 6. And so that's what we did. That's what we were prepared for because um, the Indian Act did discriminate based on sex and race. And then, uh, but then in the end, you know, so many years later, what they decided to do, the Court of Appeal, is they ruled on administrative law. And they ruled that uh, she there is some... There is some circumstantial evidence that her unknown grandfather might have been an Algonquin. So let's rule on that. So they, they really didn't, and they gave me the lesser form of Indian status, 6 2. So what ended up happening was like the Sharon MacGyver case, the charter failed me and, and the court failed me. Um, and um, anyways, there's a lot of, there's still a few problems there with that. Well, sure, I hear you. Let, let's put up another picture here. Sheldon, can I get you to put up picture number three? Because as you point out, the court didn't agree with your argument and you appealed. And what happened with the appeal? 
So when we were in the Superior Court level, the judge ruled that um, my application as a woman was being treated the same way as a man's application. And of course, that's that's ridiculous, right? We're, we're supposed to have equal treatment before and under the law, not just in terms of the administration of my application. Fortunately, there was some errors of law, but also there was some evidence that the Department of Justice refused to disclose. And that was really terrible that that happened because, of course, then the judge at the Superior Court level couldn't adjudicate my case. And I'm sure I would have won if that evidence was pushed forward. We managed to push the, for the evidence forward at the Court of Appeal, but it wasn't even heard because the, the Court of Appeal ruled on administrative law versus charter law. So they never ended up hearing the case? They never heard, they, uh, they heard the case, yes. We won at the Court of Appeal, but they didn't, um, they didn't look at the, um, the, the evidence that the Department of Justice refused to disclose, and they ruled, instead of on charter law, they ruled on administrative law. And what's your view of that? I think it was a terrible runaround, a terrible waste of en energy and agency. It's typical of the state um, to do things like that to Indigenous women. Uh, I think that they were litigating against children, not just me. I think that the Department of Justice um, and, its, and its methodology of legal, legal positivism lacks morality. I think that uh, a lot of things about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess this next part of our conversation we're going to call victory with a question mark at the end. Because in talking to you, I'm getting the sense that, yes, you did experience a victory, but not a thousand percent. Where where do you where do you see it? Um, it was hard. It was really hard when when the court of appeal ruled and they gave me six two status, a lesser form of status. Um, that meant I had to continue to rally and protest. Um, it, it was also terrible in the sense that it didn't resolve the core issue of Gale versus Canada. That the reality is that sometimes the man is not known. And that's the reality for a lot of Indigenous women and a lot of young Indigenous women. And so now what they're doing is they're insisting on um, circumstantial evidence versus accepting the fact that, like in prior to 1985, that in the situation when the man is not around or the man is unknown, the child is a status Indian like that of the mother. Hmm. So do you, as we ask the question, victory with a question mark, do you think you've won? Yes, that's a really good question, and I'm sure you want me to say yes or no, <laughs> but I have a little story. So what happened in 1985 was, um, prior to 1985, the way I describe it is the door was open for Indigenous women and children um, of unknown United States paternity. In 1985, they slapped the door shut. And they were ruling it in the in a way that the children were denied Indian status registration. And so what Gale versus Canada did was crack the door open a little bit. See, uh, I'm just going to push back on you a bit there because on this program we really don't expect yes or no answers. We often get yes and no answers because things are right. Things are never simple. Things are often very complex. Uh, what more do you think, therefore, needs to be done to get to an unambiguous yes? Well, thank you for that clarity um, <laughs> about the agenda. I really appreciate that. Um, I think that Canada should, should be doing the moral thing when it comes to Indigenous children, especially in the context of reconciliation. They should be opening their arms broadly and trying to protect and working and having policy and law that protect Indigenous women and children. And then I would say a concrete yes. Gotcha. Now, as more people become aware of their indigeneity, and may want to reclaim their roots, how much do you believe the Indian Act still stands in their way of their doing that? So every situation is different. And certainly um, in my life, uh, you know, the Indian status registration has been important. Uh, but my journey into Indigenous knowledge, into Algonquin Indigenous knowledge, um, I did it without having Indian status registration. So Indigenous knowledge is a paradigm and it's a concept and it's a responsibility. Um, but having said that, uh, 
because I was a non-status Indian, I, I couldn't be, I couldn't um, participate in meetings with chief and council of Pequok and Agon now as a status Indian. I can do that. And I am doing that regarding the issue of the Ogokan land claim process. So it, it's a yes and no. <laughs> Very well. We're used to hearing that around here. Now, the, the next question is, is, is your legal fight over? Uh, no, I'm still um, in in association and in relationship with the Famous Six and with the Feminist Alliance for International Action, and we're still pressuring uh, Canada and the Department of Indian Affairs to do the right thing and have these uh, women and their children registered. And do you think this is going to end up in the Supreme Court someday? Well, you know, the again, the issue of absolute unknown wasn't heard. Um, it is very much possible that there's going to be additional court cases um, regarding sex discrimination in the Indian Act. Yes. Hmm. I just have uh, one more question for you, or don't hold me to it. If you say something fabulous, I may want to follow up. But how about this? You've really <laughs> been through it, right? Like this has just taken an inordinate amount of your time and effort and energy. And there must have been times along the way, well, I shouldn't assume, have there been times along the way when you've just wanted to say to hell with all of it, I'm giving up? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I think that... Uh, I think that the court, the case wasn't about me. It, it never really was about me. It was about my family, my father, my grandmother. Um, as I moved along deeper into understanding Indigenous politics and Indigenous knowledge, of course, I realized that who I was was more than about the Indian Act. But, um, you know, when do you quit? After five years or 10 years or 15 years? And not only that, I really had to think about my responsibility there, that there's a lot of young mothers who couldn't take on... Um, a task like I was taking on, or, or you know, why would I want to stop and lose ten years of the struggle? So, it yes, I wanted to give up. It's it's caused me a lot of uh, heartache. It's been a very miserable process. The book actually talks about different ways that um, I, terrible power was imposed on me. So yes, I did want to give up, but you didn't. I don't know if that's always good, but in this case... <laughs> <laughs> in this case, it seems to have paid off. The book is called Gale versus Canada, Challenging Sex Discrimination in the Indian Act, which, as you've just heard over the last 20-plus minutes, has been a problem for a very long time, or certainly had been a problem, and Lynn Gale's uh, tribulations continue. Lynn, it's so good of you to make uh, time for us here on TVO tonight. Thank you, and good luck. Chimigwech, Steve. Chimigwech to you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.